Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Straight ahead on the night beat, one man is dead after a travel trailer caught fire earlier today. Reaction from neighbors as the terrifying scene unfolded. Plus, the latest on Hurricane Ida as it continues to move through South Louisiana. We'll hear from a Louisiana family with San Antonio ties who decided to ride out the storm. And a pastor at a Northwest Side church decided to give money to his worshipers. What the church leader is expecting them to do with that money. But first, a travel trailer fire claiming the life of an elderly man with disabilities this afternoon. The night team's John Paul Baraja tells us right now officials have more questions and answers about what the cause may have been. Just before 5 p.m., firefighters got a call to heavy smoke at a department complex on the 7900 block of South Flores. They quickly realized the dark black smoke was next door, pouring out of a small travel trailer. It was kind of scary when they broke the window and I saw the, all the flames coming out through the window. I, the flames were coming out so high. I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to get out of control. Luckily, it didn't. The neighbor we spoke to wished to remain anonymous, but says the fire crews on scene worked quickly and efficiently, keeping the rest of the homes and people in the park safe. However, Fire Chief Russell Johnson explained it was too late. A man living in the travel trailer. It's only mainly smoke. Uh, there was no flame even. It was just solid black thick smoke. I mean all the way to the floor when the guys opened up. They, they found an elderly handicapped gentleman on the floor uh, by the door. Neighbors watching everything unfold witnessed the lifeless body being carried out of the trailer. Long and it was very hard to see him. They laid him on the ground and they tried to work with him but they couldn't do nothing. For him. She says she didn't know her neighbor well, but he always said hi from across the street while in his wheelchair. And seeing the mortuary services come to the scene was tough. But as the person she feels for the most, the elderly man's son, who lives with him, was at work when the fire started. He was very, like, heartbroken, very, like, very crying, like, broken down. He's just sat on the ground. And that was John Paul Barajas reporting for us tonight. We have an update now on a story we've been following all this week. We now have the mug shots of the San Antonio couple charged in the death of a five year old boy who was found in a Colorado ravine. These are the mug shots of Daniel Garcia and Nicole Christina Aguilar from the Miami Dade County Sheriff's Office. Both are facing felony charges for the death of five year old Dominic Patrick Aguilar Acevedo, which is Aguilar's son. The arrest affidavit says Aguilar Acevedo was last seen alive at the Wood Spring Hotels, a suites hotel off of I-35 North near Eisenhower Road. Hotel surveillance video showed Garcia carrying the lifeless body of Aguilar Acevedo sometime in late July. His remains were found last week at a campsite in Grand County, Colorado. The couple now expected to be extradited back to San Antonio. San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers need your help finding a three time felon. Take a look at your screen right now. This is 39 year old Moises Marmolejo. Police say he has three active felony warrants here in Bear County. Two for possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute and another for a felon in possession of a firearm. If you have any information that could lead to his arrest, you are asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. You could be eligible for a reward up to $5,000. Head over to Luling, Texas, now just about an hour east of here. A tractor trailer and train collided there this afternoon and it was all caught on camera. Yeah, take a look. This is a crash that happened around 2.30 this afternoon near the intersection of Highway 90 and US 83. Officials say a truck carrying a wind turbine tried turning onto the highway while a train was coming in. The truck then overturned. Police say there was also some damage to the locomotive and the railroad crossing. Thankfully, no major injuries were reported. Now to some developing stories. We're still working to learn the name of the man killed driving on the wrong side of the interstate. According to Castle Hills Police, a driver going the wrong way on Loop 410 hit a pickup truck head on around 2 this morning. This caused another car to swerve and hit the truck as well. Police say the driver of the truck was taken to University Hospital in serious condition. The wrong way driver was pronounced dead on the scene. Tonight, police are still searching for one of the shooters involved in a shooting sparked by road rage over on the northwest side. San Antonio police say it happened on Loop 410 around 1015 last night. SAPD says two vehicles were aggressively driving with each other when someone began shooting at the other vehicle. The person driving the other vehicle was shot in the hand and grazed in the back. 
The driver pulled over at a car dealership to call 911. He was taken to University Hospital where he is expected to be okay. He says he did not know the suspect. At last check, half a million people are without power in Louisiana as Category 4 Hurricane Ida slams into shore. The eye of the storm was about 50 miles southwest of New Orleans. Evidence of that storm, a path of destruction. Shortly before it arrived, we talked to the sister and niece of our own anchor, Ursula Perry, who are riding out that storm. I wonder if I have a house to return to. Sarah Bourgeois sought refuge with her mother, Bernadine LaPerry, in Covington, Louisiana, higher ground as Hurricane Ida approached. We were like in the red zone, the really bad weather. This is the first time I've evacuated probably since Katrina, but this storm freaked me out. Turn on the news and I'm like, okay, this is getting worse. It's not dying, it's getting bigger. Louisiana officials say Ida, now one of the most powerful storms to hit the U.S., arrived around noon today, taking down power to thousands thousands in and around Orleans Parish. Winds of more than 150 miles an hour tore off roofs and brought down trees. It arrived on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Katrina taught us all a really hard lesson. Uh, it took way too long for it to get any services or help. Bourgeois and Le Perry have stocked up on food, gas, flashlights, and a generator, bracing for days without access to food or water. Some hotels in higher areas charging up to $300 a night. There's no hotel rooms. Yeah, just, I guess, sleep in your car. But even if they wanted to leave, there was no way out. By the time we realized how big it was, um, the interstate was blocked. And about an hour ago, they told us they have no power. It's windy and rainy, and there's lots of trees down around them, but they are trying to stay positive. We'll keep you posted on them in the days ahead. Still a long way for them to go tonight. Hurricane Ida also now causing trouble for a gas company, one of the nation's largest pipelines closing off two fuel lines in the south due to that storm. Colonial Pipeline says it shut down fuel lines between Houston and Greensboro, North Carolina today. The uh, company called the temporary move a precautionary and routine safety measure. They expect to get back to full service as soon as that storm wraps up. But first, it has to evaluate its infrastructure and execute a startup plan. The 5,500 mile pipeline provides nearly half of the East Coast gasoline and diesel. Hurricane Ida, one of the worst storms in Louisiana's history, making landfall on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, bringing extreme winds and flooding. ABC's Elizabeth Schultz is in New Orleans. Hurricane Ida is ripping through Louisiana, leaving devastation in its path. Ida coming ashore as a powerful Category 4 storm and staying as a Cat 4 for several more hours. This is one of the strongest storms to make landfall here in modern times. Hurricane hunters flying into the storm's stunning 17-mile-wide eye. After landfall, catastrophic storm surge of up to eight feet. Winds up to 150 miles an hour. We are here in the heart of New Orleans just as this storm has made landfall. You can feel how strong these winds are. This is the Mississippi. This storm is testing the city's flood protection system. Those systems and levees were built up after Hurricane Katrina exactly 16 years ago. Officials here are still worried about heavy rain causing flash floods. This is a very dangerous and a very real situation. Hundreds of thousands in the state are already without power. President Biden visiting FEMA for a briefing, saying the agency deployed 2,400 employees to the region. As soon as the storm passes, we're going to put uh, this, uh, we're going to put the country's full might behind the rescue and recovery. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, New Orleans. It is still very bad over in South Louisiana. And coming up in just a couple of minutes, I'll have the latest radar imagery of Hurricane Ida and also the latest stats. A new update from the Hurricane Center came out at 10 o'clock tonight. Meanwhile, here at home, hope you had a great weekend. It was warm. We had some rain both days today. It was focused primarily across portions of the hill country, and there are actually still a couple of showers out there at this time. Dry in San Antonio and Bear County. Our temperatures are in the low 80s. Calm winds and a few clouds out there at this hour. Looking ahead to your Monday, um, I've actually increased rain chances just a bit. I forgot to update the graphic, but we're actually going to go with a 40% chance of rain tomorrow. We'll talk more about that and more on Ida coming up in just a bit. Thank you, Katie. A far northwest side church is reversing the offering plate 
at its morning services by giving each family an envelope of cash today. Yeah, the night team's Garrett Berenger tells us why the church doesn't expect most of the money to stay within the congregation. One, two, three, open it up. Normally it's churchgoers donating their money to their place of worship. But today, the families at Oak Hills Church were the ones handed envelopes, each with $100 inside. Today we're flipping the script. The church says it gave away 762 envelopes, and there's still more to go, as they had had more people attend than they had anticipated. Uh, I think the, the coolest feeling was not the moment when they opened it, but when they realized uh, the challenge to go into how to use it. Moore tells us for the congregants who may be struggling, that money is theirs. For those who aren't, the church hopes they put it to good use. Lead minister Travis Eads told parishioners who didn't need the money to find a way to pay it forward. And you, you know needs that we will never know. And you can reach people that we would never be able to reach. Moore says it was a spontaneous idea that had come out of a meeting this week and a story of someone who had done something similar. Now they're eager to hear what stories will come out of this. And we're excited to see how uh, stories flood back in of how uh, each person uh, goes into the places where they live, work, learn and play and get to use that money uh, for the benefit of others. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And happening on Wednesday, we will be hosting a KSAT Community Town Hall discussing food insecurity in Bear County. Max Massey and Sarah Acosta will be joined by CEO of the San Antonio Food Bank, Eric Cooper, and experts on nutrition and health. If you have any questions for the panelists, you can submit them right now on KSAT.com. Again, our Feeding Tomorrow Town Hall will be this Wednesday at 2 p.m. Still ahead on the night, we'll have the latest on the COVID-19 pandemic, why we might not return to normalcy by this fall. Plus, a preview of this week's KSAT Explains on the debate over homeless encampments. Tonight, a nation in mourning following that tragic attack overseas. Those fallen service members from last week's deadly attack now back on U.S. soil. Yeah, this all comes as U.S. officials issue an urgent warning to Americans in Kabul. ABC's Ike Jachi in Washington tonight with the new security threat and what the Secretary of State had to say about it. A solemn scene in Delaware as our nation's heroes arrived home. U.S. servicemen carrying out the dignified transfer of the fallen following last week's deadly attack in Kabul. Off to the side, President Biden and high-ranking cabinet officials. The moment as the situation in Afghanistan remains tense as the August 31st withdrawal deadline approaches. An alert issued to Americans around Kabul's airport. The U.S. Embassy warning U.S. citizens should avoid traveling to the airport and avoid all airport gates at this time. This is the most dangerous time in an already extraordinarily dangerous mission these last couple of days. And so we will do everything possible to keep uh, to keep people safe, but the risk is very high. 13 servicemen and women killed in last Thursday's suicide bombing, along with dozens of Afghans. In retaliation, the U.S. military carrying out a drone strike against an ISIS-K planner and facilitator on Friday. And today, a drone strike on a vehicle in Kabul to eliminate an imminent ISIS-K threat. Lawmakers on both sides urging President Biden to extend the deadline to allow evacuations for U.S. troops and their allies. But his administration holding firm. And if the Taliban is... Um serious about the commitments that it's repeatedly made in public, including nationally across the country, as well as in private, commitments that the international community intends to hold the Taliban to, uh, then uh, we'll find ways to do it. Nebraska GOP Senator Ben Sass not buying the response. That interview was disgusting and the American people have a right to be livid about it. There is clearly no, no plan. <clears throat> there has been no plan. Their plan has basically been happy talk. This, as a new ABC News Ipsos poll, shows overwhelming bipartisan support for keeping U.S. troops in the country until all Americans and Afghans who aided the U.S. during the 20-year war have been evacuated. Ike Jachi, ABC News, Washington. 
Turning now to weather back here at home, Katie, all eyes continue to be on South Louisiana tonight. Ida continuing to uh, diminish in strength, but still a long way to go for these folks. They've been, been pounded all day. It's just not moving. The yeah. movement is around like 10 miles per hour. So this torrential rain has just been sitting over the same places for hours. That on top of the storm surge, especially up south of places like New Orleans, is leading to some catastrophic flooding tonight. Unfortunately, the reports starting to show up on social media, Twitter, uh, they are not good. So this continues to be a dire situation for our friends over in South Louisiana. As of the 10 p.m. update, winds are still at 105 miles per hour. At landfall, they were at 150, so we're making progress, but still just a mess here. Still a very strong Category 2 hurricane uh, sitting essentially between Baton Rouge and New Orleans uh, just south of I-10 there. That's the center there where you see that red 2 icon. Big picture shows, of course, a lot of very heavy rain, especially east of the center. That red box is a tornado watch box, so they're not only dealing with the storm surge, the flooding rain, but also in the outer bands of this tropical system, there are typically a lot of spin up tornadoes. So they're dealing with that as far east as Mobile, Alabama and the panhandle of Florida. So Ida will continue to move inland tonight by tomorrow morning, likely weakening to a tropical storm, but it will continue to drop heavy rain across parts of Mississippi, Alabama tomorrow, eventually up to places like Tennessee by the middle of the week. So we are thinking of our friends over in Louisiana. In comparison, very quiet here across the Lone Star State tonight. As Ida continues to move northeast here, uh, our weather pattern is overall going to remain pretty quiet over the next several days. We don't have a lot of big movers and shakers to steer our weather, but we will have a little ridge of high pressure that's going to start to build in over the next few days. It really builds in and kind of sits over places like Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma as we get toward the middle and back half of this week. What that means for us is that we'll be sitting on the southern edge of this ridge and that's going to allow for some little pieces of rain making energy where you see these orange and red colors. Those will uh, kind of rotate around the southern edge of this ridge of high pressure and that is what's going to keep daily rain chances in the forecast for us all the way through this work week. Uh, tomorrow looks pretty good. I've upped our rain chances for tomorrow just based on some of the latest guidance that I'm seeing, uh, but I know 10 to 20 percent is not great, but I do think simply because of our weather setup this week, each day could feature some pop up showers and thunderstorms. So something to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we look ahead to this new week. 83 at the airport now calm winds. It is muggy out there feeling like 88 at this hour. It's 81 up in New Braunfels. We've got 70s up in the the hill country are dew points for everyone essentially in the 70s. So that muggy air, uh, it is pretty easy to come by out across South Central Texas. Uh, most of the activity as far as rain went today was west of 35 up in the hill country. Essentially all afternoon we had some really spotty downpours, a couple rumbles of thunder, and even at this hour there are still a couple of downpours uh, across a portion of Bandera County there south of Medina, west of Bandera. Also across the western and northern portion of Medina County, even northern Uvalde County, we've got a little shower there south of Concan. As we head into the overnight hours, essentially all this will start to fizzle out, but nonetheless I'm going to hold on to a chance of a stray shower mainly west of 35 through early tomorrow morning. For most of us, though, just muggy as you step out the door tomorrow with temperatures um, in the mid to upper 70s, low 70s in the hill country. As we approach lunchtime, I do think we'll start to see a few more thunder showers pop up mainly north of Highway 90, and then we'll see a nice scattering of some more downpours tomorrow afternoon. Into the early evening hours, coverage wise, we'll go about a 40% chance for some of these showers and non severe storms. There could be some heavy rain, just like the past several days, and also some lightning strikes. Uh, but I'm not expecting a lot of organized thunderstorm activity tomorrow but some more heavy downpours will be possible. Looking at the week ahead, more low end daily rain chances stick with us all the way through the start of next weekend. Still no triple digits. Yes. All right. And summer's <laughs> almost over. Uh, we're getting there like a month, almost yeah, a month. Almost yeah. there. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Uh -huh. All right. Greg Simmons will be along to join us for a preview of Instant Replay right after this. The Dallas Cowboys end their preseason winless. So should we be concerned with more on that and what's on Instant Replay tonight? Let's check in with our Greg Simmons. You know, hopefully the magic of Dak will bring them back and ready to go for week one. And the Houston Texans in their preseason with a lot of unanswered questions coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay.
Trevor Lawrence may be a little more difficult to defend here this afternoon. Oh, wide open down the sideline. That's Farrell Cooper. I would say yes. The Dallas Cowboys end their preseason by losing to the Jacksonville Jaguars with the first team defense held out. Rookie Trevor Lawrence lights up the Dallas D and did the final exhibition game give head coach Mike McCarthy a better look at who should be Dak's backup. You're in trouble. First down at the 24. Brady again. High toss. Pull down. Touchdown. Chris Godwin. That was a vintage Tom Brady drive. He's still good. The Houston Texans closed out their preseason with a loss to seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was on fire to start the game, but the Texans' offense needs a lot of work if Tyrod Taylor is going to be their starting quarterback. And the first week of the high school football season is in the books. We have the best fans, best pass, best catch, and best run, the best hit, and, of course, the best game. Tonight, you'll find out in the best of big game coverage, plus an all-new 12 Top 12, and in sub 5A as well. All that plus, who is more surprising is starting quarterback in Texas or Texas A&M? Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's right after the night beat. And we have reached the most wonderful time of the year. Yes, football we have. Season. College football <laughs> and all the football season. You're right. Thank you, Greg. We'll see you again in just a little bit. Coming up here, the latest on the COVID-19 pandemic, why the nation's top disease expert says a return to normal by the fall is quickly disappearing. Plus, details on another hurricane that made landfall in Mexico. That and more. Stay with us on the Night Beat. Welcome back. Let's get to the latest now on the COVID-19 pandemic. The nation's top disease expert says the hope for a so-called return to normalcy from COVID-19 this fall and winter appears to be fading fast. Yeah, hospitalizations are up nationwide, especially in the South, where some places are facing a shortage of oxygen. John Lawrence has more. The rate of COVID-19 related deaths rose in 42 states last week, according to Johns Hopkins University. And a projection from the University of Washington finds 100,000 more people could die from the virus by December. What is going on now? is both entirely predictable, but entirely preventable. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, says there are roughly 80 million people in the U.S. who are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine, but have yet to get it. It's so important now in this crisis that we're in that people put aside any ideologic, political, or other differences and just get vaccinated. But some Americans aren't convinced. You choose what you should do, what you feel is right for you and your family. It's not about being Republican or Democrat. Including those who held a Freedom from COVID rally Saturday in the Kentucky State Capitol. They say they don't want to be forced to roll up their sleeves or wear masks. It's my body. And no, no one needs to decide that for me. No one should ever decide that for anybody. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, all 50 states have a high COVID-19 transmission rate, while just half of the U.S. and Washington, D.C. have at least 50 percent of their population fully vaccinated. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Ed Asner, the actor best known for his role as Lou Grant on the Mary Tyler show, uh, Mary Tyler Moore show has passed away. According to Asner's publicist, Asner died peacefully surrounded by his family at his home in Los Angeles. His role on the Mary Tyler Moore show won him three Emmys and two Golden Globes. Now, later in his career, Asner played Santa in the Christmas favorite Elf. He was also known for campaigning for equal rights amendments. Asner was 91 years old. Turning now to stories making headlines around America. A small plane crashed into some trees in someone's backyard in Spartanburg, South Carolina today. Take a look. Crews stabilized the plane and used foam to keep fuel from leaking or starting a fire. Fire officials said three people in that plane were injured and had to be taken to the hospital. The assistant fire chief said he doesn't know the condition of the victims. The cause of that crash also unknown tonight. Spartanburg fire officials said the Federal Aviation Administration will be investigating. Better check your fridge. We have a recall to tell you about. The OSDA is warning consumers about a recall of 862,000 pounds of Italian antipasto because of salmonella contamination. Fratelli Beretta is saying the recall includes its 24-ounce trace of uncured Italian meats sold at Costco. The CDC has connected the company's 
charcuterie assortments to a salmonella outbreak with cases in 17 states. While there have been no fatalities, the CDC has reported 36 illnesses and 12 hospitalizations between May and late July. People who have purchased the product can return it to their local Costco or call the company's hotline at 866-918-8738. Take a look ahead now. A brand new episode of KSAT Explains will be out Tuesday night. And this week, the team is focusing on homeless encampments in the debate over whether to allow them. Myra Arthur now with a preview. You may have seen them. Tents set up near bridges or overpasses. Communities created by people living on the street. The issue of homelessness is far from a new problem, but homeless encampments are getting new attention as the arguments over what to do about them have gotten louder. As Austin voters weigh a camping ban proposition, Texas lawmakers are considering bills to prohibit homeless encampments across the state. But some are concerned the bill the state legislature passed will lead to criminalizing the homeless population. With a new state law banning encampments, plus the end to the federal eviction moratorium, rising rent and home costs, preventing and combating homelessness has never been a more pressing issue. But it's more than a policy debate. It's lives at stake. It's been rough the last couple of months. Personally, I feel a little boxed in in the house. We're survivors anyway, but, but we want to do better and we want to have something, something else. And the people dedicated to helping the homeless want the same. Every situation is so different. As much as I would love to say there's a one solution, it's, it's such a complicated problem. In this episode of KSAT Explains, we're taking a closer look at the debate over encampments. We'll hear from people experiencing homelessness and those fighting every day to help them change that. KSAT explains the debate over homeless encampments again out on Tuesday. We'll stream the episode live on KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app on streaming devices, and KSAT's Facebook page at 7 p.m. If you don't catch it live, we'll post the full episode so you can watch it on demand later Tuesday or whenever you get to it. While all eyes have been on Hurricane Ida and Louisiana, over in Mexico, Hurricane Nora made landfall in Puerto Vallarta. According to the National Hurricane Center, Nora made landfall as a weak category one. Winds were measured up to 75 miles per hour. Buildings collapsed and rivers were overflowing in the storm's aftermath. Soldiers in the Mexican Army were called to help people caught in the fast-moving waters. Traffic's causing a lot of problems uh, across uh, North America here <laughs> this weekend. 83 outside currently. Uh, in comparison, been a quiet weekend for us here. A couple of uh, showers both afternoons. Uh, we had some heavy rain uh, into Friday as well. And I do expect another round of some scattered downpours, mainly in the afternoon on Monday. So do keep that in mind for any after school activities you may have on the calendar for tomorrow. Let's hope you get a little bit of rain to cool you off because if not, we're looking at another hot afternoon with highs back in the mid to upper 90s for a lot of us. We'll talk more about your work week forecast, a little bit more about what else is going on in the tropics. We've actually got two new systems to talk about other than Ida. Uh, we'll talk about all that more coming up in just a bit. Patty. All right, thanks, Katie. Well, still ahead, rapper Kanye West released his new album over the weekend. We'll have that and more on your entertainment headlines. But up first, a restaurant in Cibolo is giving the phrase pay it forward a whole new meaning. We'll tell you what that's all about in a new What's Up South Texas right after this. Welcome back. We all know the hospitality industry took a big hit during the pandemic, but one Cibolo restaurant didn't let that stop them from serving their community. In today's What's Up South Texas, the night team's Jaffney Gray with how they took the phrase pay it forward to a new third level. You know, I don't think we ever had a thought of, you know, giving up. God's hand was in it a lot. Dave and Jackie Peterson opened their Cibolo Bar and Restaurant, Mako's on the Creek, a few years ago. So I was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, and we have a habit of naming each other. So I was named Mako 
which is the second deadliest shark in the world. So it was kind of a good name to have. But like many in the hospitality industry, they had no idea the toll the pandemic would take on their small business and the community. They could have closed their doors, but they didn't. Many of our staff members, this is how they take care of their families. They brought back a pay it forward idea their oldest son came up with years ago. But this time, instead of paying it forward one drink at a time at the bar, they decided to pay it forward with meals. People could donate $10 and that would be one meal. And the meal was a burger, a chicken sandwich, or a salad. You could say, hey, I want to send 20 meals to a hospital. Or you could say, hey, you do with it as you see fit. Essential workers were a priority. Reaching out to hospitals, reaching out to clinics, reaching out to schools, reaching out to a lot of different nursing homes. Once we launched it, the community was amazing. It allowed people that wanted to help an avenue to help and it allowed our staff to work so they got to continue to do what they love to do and able to able to make a living. They even provided All right, coming up, the reigning box office champ lost the title this weekend to a scary new movie. We'll have a look at the top movies in this weekend's box office later on the Night Beat. All right, Katie Blake has been busy doing some research, some homework over there, looking yeah. at uh, the history of the strength of hurricanes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so we're going to talk about Ida again. And to our viewers at home, I hope you're not sick of hearing about Ida because you are going to hear a lot about it over the coming days. Um, because this is a big deal. We've likely got loss of life ongoing across South Louisiana because of this major hurricane. So in case you missed the high points when it comes to Ida's landfall, that was 1155 AM Texas time uh, at Port Fusho, Louisiana, which is down the coast from Grand Isle, essentially due south as the crow flies from New Orleans. Ida made landfall as a category four hurricane with 150 mile per hour winds. Category Five status is 157 mile per hour winds or above. So when we're talking about how strong this hurricane was, that it was a record breaking significant and you think, well, it wasn't a cat five, so whatever. Well, it was only seven miles per hour away from being a cat five, so a very high end cat four. And it was actually tied with a hurricane back in 1856 and Laura, which was just last year for having the highest wind speeds upon landfall in Louisiana. So if you look back at all the hurricanes that have ever hit the Louisiana coast, Ida, Laura last year, and then one back in 1856 are all tied for having the highest wind speeds upon landfall, 150 miles per hour. Minimum pressure at landfall, 930 millibars. Remember, the lower the pressure, the stronger the tropical system. So I mentioned that Ida today, Laura just last year along the coast of Louisiana, two of the strongest hurricanes that have made landfall there in terms of wind speed. Um, and let's talk about things in terms of longer term. That's how we talk about climate. Weather is today. Climate is what's happening over many, many years. And thanks to this research provided by Climate Central, we do see a trend that Atlantic Basin hurricanes are getting stronger. That means our hurricanes, a higher percentage of them are making landfall as major hurricanes. Major hurricanes are category three, four, or five. So we've got an average line here. We do have some ebbs and flows. In fact, between about 2008, 2015, we had a decrease in the number of Atlantic hurricanes becoming major hurricanes. But on average here, our average line, this white line, back 1979 to 1981, about 15% of all Atlantic hurricanes were major hurricanes. Now, latest batch of data, 2015 to 2017, were about 39% of all Atlantic hurricanes becoming major hurricanes. This is due to warming air, increasing global temperature, but also increasing sea surface temperatures. Remember, the warmer the water is, 
the stronger these tropical systems can become. So here's the latest on Ida as of 10 p.m. Continuing to move north northwest at just nine miles per hour. It is slow. That's what's causing the issues. This torrential flooding rain is just sitting over some of the same places, and that's why we're likely going to see some loss of life because of flooding down in South Louisiana. By tomorrow morning, it's a tropical storm moving into Mississippi. More rain for uh, the Tennessee River Valley up into eventually the northeast by later this week. Ida is not the only thing we have going. We've got Tropical Depression 10 and Tropical Storm Julian. Both of these, thankfully, will stay out over the open Atlantic. But coming off the coast of Africa, we've got another uh, tropical wave that has high odds of becoming our next tropical depression within the next two to five days. So we've already used up Julian here. Next name on the list is Kate followed by Larry. Not unusual to see so much activity out in the Atlantic Basin. We are approaching the peak of Atlantic hurricane season as far as number of hurricanes and named uh, tropical storms. That's typically around the middle of September. A quick look at your forecast for tomorrow. I mentioned last half hour I have upped your rain chances to about a 40% chance for some afternoon downpours tomorrow. Currently, we've got a couple of lingering showers across Uvalde, uh, Bandera, and Medina counties. None of this activity is severe, just some run of the mill rain. As we get into tomorrow afternoon past lunchtime, we'll see some scattered downpours. More heavy rain will be possible, some flashes of lightning, but no severe weather tomorrow. If you do get rain on Monday, consider yourself lucky that'll help to cool you down just a touch guys yeah cool down a little bit over the weekend so that's good yeah not so bad all right uh, when we come back we'll have another preview of instant replay and a look at the weekend box office what do you want don't breathe two made 2.8 million dollars for a fifth place finish five million dollars put jungle cruise in fourth place and over 100 million domestic Paw Patrol the movie landed in third place, earning $6.6 million. Do you mean to tell me that nobody snapped up those bad boys? Today's the day. After two weekends on top, Free Guy fell to second, racking up $13.6 million for a domestic total of $79 million. One day, she just snaps. Plenty of people said the name Candyman. The horror sequel scared up $22.4 million to spirit away the box office crown. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. In other entertainment news, rapper Kanye West released his new album, Donda, over the weekend. The 27 tracks are now available on to listen to on Spotify. The album features songs with Jay-Z, The Weeknd, and others. While he was working on the album, Wes took up residence in the Mercedes-Benz st Stadium in Atlanta. Before releasing Donda, he hosted a listening event in his hometown of Chicago on Thursday. He was living in a sports stadium? Apparently. Okay, well, that's a nice transition. We are ready for the first big weekend of college football kicking off this Saturday. Who has the better chance to win their season opener, UTSA or UIW? Well, after returning home a champion, what did San Antonio's own Joshua Frankel learn from his third bout with Andrew Maloney? Let's find out what else is on Instant Replay tonight by heading over to our Greg Sims. Now, I want to find out why he's living in the I gotta know Mercedes more Stadium. I gotta Google this. Nah, we're going to have to look this up before the show's <laughs> over. And let me hear grad headlines of Fight Card at the Floresville Events Center coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Martinez directing traffic. He'll float it up there. Oliver Martin, that ball is broken up, and that will do it. Illinois is going to beat Nebraska in Brett Bielema's debut. How about that? The college football season kicks off in full swing this weekend as UTSA Roadrunners open up on the road against Illinois, the same team that just knocked off Nebraska this past weekend. And UIW is also on the road against Youngstown State, and Trinity welcomes McMurray. We'll get you ready for the season openers and some major milestones in high school volleyball. After fight number two ended in controversy, Franco feels really good about what he was able to accomplish here. What did San Antonio world champion Joshua Franco learn from his last fight in his trilogy against Andrew Maloney? Tonight he will tell us, and a Lanier grad headlining a fight card in Floresville will get you ready for the ringing. Wait until you see some special drone footage that was unveiled on the latest episode of Hard Knocks. Instant replay is live, and it's next, and they show some outtakes of it where the, zone, the little drone actually crashed a couple of times trying to do this trick. Getting through that truck would have been yeah that was yeah, that was the start that yeah. wasn't where it crashed <laughs> okay, we'll have to look for that i'm getting dizzy just watching that behind <laughs> yeah. you there all right coming up we'll introduce you to the tsa security dog of the year that's next and tell me something good
Okay, finally tonight, something good. We know that news can be hard to hear at times, so we wanted to end your night by telling you something good. The TSA unveiling this year's winner for the cutest security dog. The award went to Alana, a four-year-old golden retriever that works at the McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas. Alana is highly skilled and trained to detect explosives. She was one of four finalists in the three-day nationwide social media contest. As part of her big win, she'll appear in the cover of Dog on the 2022 TSA K9 calendar. She is a good girl. That is all of our time. Thanks so much for watching KSAT 12. Be sure to catch Good Morning San Antonio with all your overnight news. Instant replay is next. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Instant Replay. The 2021 high school football season kicked off with a bang. We'll have a full review of the best of big game coverage. The college football season also kicked off with Nebraska falling to Illinois, but Texas A&M and Texas kick off their season this coming weekend with two new quarterbacks. We will discuss that in Sports Guys, and the NFL preseason is officially over after the Cowboys close out today on game day. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Now the Dallas or Jacksonville had won a preseason game this month. The Cowboys resting their starters this afternoon, while the Jaguars did not. And that means we got to see what the number one overall draft pick, Trevor Lawrence, can do. Jacksonville's first drive, Lawrence is going to hook up with an open Farrell Cooper for the 18-yard touchdown. His first NFL touchdown in the preseason. The Jags are up 7-0 after one. Now we go to the second quarter, Trevor Lawrence making it look easy. Four yards to LaVisca Chenault Jr. Just like that, Jacksonville is up. 14 to nothing. Cowboys finally get a drive going, going 80 yards on 10 plays. Capped off by this 19-yard pass from Garrett Gilbert to Aaron Parker for the touchdown. Cowboys are down seven. Under two minutes to play in the first half, C.J. Bethard, Bethard in for Lawrence as he gets tackled by Rondell Carter. He's hit as he throws. The ball is picked off. Downfield by Israel Mukayamu, but Dallas couldn't score off the turnover, and Jacksonville leads 17-7 at the half. Third quarter, quarterback Jake Lutton now for Jacksonville. He connects with Laquan Treadwell, which sneaks in for the 11-yard score. Jags lead 24-7, headed into the fourth quarter. Jaguars go up 34-7 before Dallas can find the end zone. Again, Ben DiNucci finds Johnny Dixon for the eight-yard touchdown, and that would be the final points the Cowboys get in exhibition. Jags win at 34-14. Cowboys go 0-4 in the preseason. While rookies are grateful for playing time, they're hoping their mistakes doesn't keep them from making the final roster on Tuesday. Uh, it's very important. Um, I think that was my first time getting scored on, so now I know what it feels like. Uh, so uh, it's definitely important just being able to go out there and make the mistakes early uh, and just now I just got to learn from it and erase it from my game. I mean, at this point, I mean, uh, we'll just see where, where it takes us. Uh, if I'm in the building on Thursday, then I made the team. If I, if I didn't, then uh, just got to move on. So how did the Cowboys quarterbacks minus Dak Prescott do in the preseason? Today marked the first game in the preseason that Dallas did not have a thrown interception or fumble. Garrett Gilbert finished the preseason with 301 yards passing, one touchdown. Cooper Rush, 272 yards passing, two TDs. Ben DiNucci had 348 yards, one touchdown, but four interceptions, including three in the Houston game alone. So how did Gilbert and Rush look heading into the, these tough decisions? I thought they were solid. Um, I, I thought both those guys, you know, did what you're, you know, they, they, they had clean plays I, you know I, you know so much of playing the quarterback position in the preseason and especially in the second half of preseason games because I've, I've coached it that way for for decades is things are going to go wrong and um, you know Ben DiNucci had a number of situations where the route wasn't right or you know different situation you got to play through that. that that's part of the adversity of playing preseason football truly though you know I felt like you know I was proud of what I put on tape and you know I'm going to continue to work on every single day you know preseason games are over now but you know in practice um, just continuing to work and improve on being the best quarterback I can be and staying ready for my opportunity so that's you know that it, those decisions are out of my hands and um, and so uh, you know I'm just going to worry about what I can control. By the way, if you missed the last episode of Hard Knocks, you missed an awesome video of a drone flying in and out of the Cowboy Star Complex. Really awesome to watch. It's over two minutes long. Make sure to check it out on the HBO's Episode 4. comes out on Tuesday. There's also a cool look at the Cowboys offensive tackle Isaac Alarcon, who is from Monterrey, Mexico. There's also a feature on the Cowboys Azur Kamara in Episode 2, who escaped the Civil War in Ivory Coast as a child.
The Houston Texans wrapped up their preseason with their only loss to the defending Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers in Houston on Saturday night. Seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady started off slow with a three-and-out first series, but after that, he roared, <laughs> leading the Bucs to two long drives. The first was a 91-yard drive in the first quarter with Brady connecting with Chris Goodwin for the touchdown. Then, later, a 93-yard drive. They ended with running back Ronald Jones capping it off with this touchdown. That pushed the Bucs out to a 13-0 lead. Brady left the game 11-14 of for 154 yards. Deshaun Watson was a no-show for the game, not even on the sidelines as Tyrod Taylor struggled with the first-team offense, throwing for only 31 yards on six of nine completions. It was actually the Texas defense that would score the first points when Demarcus Walker sacked backup quarterback Blaine Gabbard in the end zone for the safety. The Texas defense also grabbed three turnovers, two fumble recoveries, and an interception to give them 10 takeaways this preseason compared to nine total in all of last year's regular season. But the offense gave it away more than they should. Rookie Davis Mills took over for Taylor and did throw two touchdowns, one to Nico Conch, got the lead to 16-10, to 10, the other to Jordan Vesey for nine yards, but he also threw three interceptions in the 23-16 to 16 loss. The first priority on offense is to not give up the ball. And we gave it, gave it up way too many times. One is too many. It doesn't matter how many you get on defense. When you turn it over on offense, your chances of winning are very slim. And that was very disappointing. We could be better. I could be better first and foremost. Um, and we could be better as a unit. Um, but I also think we did some, some good things out there. We just shot ourselves in the foot and then gave our, ourselves the best opportunity um, to be successful in this game with the, uh, with the turnover. It was always tough to overcome those. The Texans were without kicker Kai Fairbairn, who was held out due to an injury. So safety Justin Reed handled kickoffs. And not bad. 65, 61, 48 yarder. Even made the tackle on the second one. The Texans did not allow him to attempt a field goal, even though he wanted to, and went for two after the touchdown. So here's a look at week one for the Dallas Cowboys in the regular season does kick off September the 9th Cowboys against the Buccaneers and then for the Texans they will host the Jaguars Sunday September the 12th at high noon. San Antonio Joshua Franco returned home after defeating Australia's Andrew Maloney in his second trilogy fight. Franco was kind of enough to stop by Case at 12 to talk about his latest victory. We asked what was the biggest lesson he learned against Maloney considering he won the first fight with a dominant showing in the later rounds, but then was attacked early in the second fight, which ended in a no contest due to headbutt. So what was the biggest lesson learned for El Professor? Yes, it can. I would say it can, especially um of how, how dominant I, you know, I beat him in the first fight, you know, uh, so I thought it was going to be even easier this time around. Uh, you know, even in camp, you know, I didn't do my diet right, you know, go, going into the second fight, I was, you know, eating a lot of junk food and stuff, and, okay. you know, I wasn't really worried about, you know, the, the, the weight and stuff, and that, that cost me as well. So would you say that's the most valuable lesson you've learned in your pro career so far is to not ever overlook an opponent? Yes, yes, it, it is. That, that is my most valuable lesson, and, you know, I learned from it. I learned the hard way. Um, you know, but I mean, now now I'm back where I want to be. So, you know, uh, I'm happy and, you know, I'm just excited for, for what's to come. Franco is slated to be the mandatory challenger for the winner of Juan Francisco Estrada and Roman Gonzalez fight, better known as Chocolito. And those two will fight for a third time against each other this coming October on ESPN. You can check out our interview with Franco right now on Instant Replay page of KSAT.com. And there's fights coming to Floresville Event Center. The main event will feature Lanier grad Rick Medina, who's 10 and 0 with six knockouts. He'll face Rafael Reyes, who is 20 and 8 with 16 knockouts. It all goes down Saturday, September the 25th. You can get tickets by calling the number on your screen. Time now for tonight's Instant Replay poll question: Who is more surprising starting quarterback? Hudson Card beating out Casey Thompson at UT. Haynes King over at Zach. Calzada at AM. Vote now. We have the results at the end of the broadcast tonight. When we come back, there's nothing quite like the sound of high school football kicking off. Four, five, six. The best of big game coverage has the best plays from the first week of the high school football season, and we had a lot to pick from. Also, get you ready for next week with an all new 12 stop 12 for 6A and 5A, sub 5A teams as well. In volleyball, two young ladies from New Braunfels Canyon had some personal milestones set last week. We'll explain what they are going into a big match on Tuesday. And the sports guys show you the first week matchup for the Longhorns, Aggies, Roadrunners, Cardinals, and Trinity Tigers. How do we think the season will go for each of these teams? Find out. Instant Replay continues live next.